Recent evidence from large randomized controlled trials in hip fracture surgery show that there is no benefit so far of regional anesthesia over general anesthesia on mortality or major morbidity outcomes. But what about something more short-term, yet still important, like post-operative pain and opiate use? I was trained to believe that the priority in hip fracture patients was to manage preoperative pain, emphasized partly through messaging that we should be doing fascia iliaca blocks or similar in the emergency department and the ward to spare opioid use. But my observation has been that most patients are quite comfortable as long as they remain immobile, which is generally the case while they're waiting for surgery. And many of our patients decline preoperative blocks in the inpatient ward. There's an accompanying perception that once the fracture has been fixed, the patient becomes miraculously pain-free and these patients are often left to the mercies of the orthopedic service for pain management rather than being followed by our acute pain service as we might do for total hip replacements patients. I think this may not be entirely rational. This 2022 paper from Newman and colleagues is a pre-planned secondary analysis of the data from the REGAIN study that examined pain and opioid analgesic use after hip surgery. The REGAIN study was a randomized controlled trial in which 1,600 patients received either spinal or general anesthesia with no other restrictions on perioperative care, including the specific drugs administered, where the peripheral nerve blocks were performed, or the perioperative analgesic regimen. As it turned out, about a third of the patients in either group received a nerve block at the time of surgery. Patients were assessed on postoperative days 1 through 3 and asked to rate the worst pain and the average pain they had experienced during the last 24 hours, as well as the pain they were experiencing at the time of the interview. As you can see, the majority of patients reported worst pain scores that were in the severe range throughout all three days, and average pain scores that were moderate in severity. Although there were statistically significant differences in the worst and average pain scores on post-operative day one in favor of the general anesthetic group, Opioid requirements were similar between the two groups, and given the high crossover rate, I wouldn't read too much into this result. Instead, I think the key takeaway is that patients do have significant postoperative pain after hip fracture surgery. What's interesting, though, is that when asked to rate their pain at the time of interview, the clustering of pain scores is in the mild range of the scale. This is when many physicians see their patients while they're at rest, which may explain our general impression that the surgery isn't associated with a lot of pain. However, as we can see, the data clearly shows that hip fracture patients have a significant amount of postoperative pain. And if we think about it logically, this isn't surprising at all. They now have musculoskeletal pain from surgical trauma. And if they have a dynamic hip screw or intramedullary nail rather than arthroplasty, they may still experience bony pain from micromotion at the fracture fixation site. But most importantly, they're in pain because they're now expected to mobilize. Their worst pain scores likely reflect pain with mobilization, with the interview pain scores reflecting pain at rest. And the average pain scores are in between these two extremes. We should therefore start actively managing post-operative pain after hip fracture surgery in the same way that we manage post-operative pain after total hip replacement surgery. The goals are the same after all, mobilization, return to function, and opioid minimization. Follow up by the acute pain service, multimodal analgesia, and the incorporation of regional anesthetic techniques are logical steps to take. We may need to explore the same therapies we use in total hip replacement, intrathecal morphine, local infiltration analgesia by the surgeons, or peripheral nerve blocks. Note that hip fracture surgery encompasses different techniques, and our regional anesthesia strategies should take this into account. Intrathecal morphine may be the simplest and safest solution, yet one that is underutilized. This 2008 study found that only 6% of UK anesthesiologists used intrathecal morphine in hip fracture. There is data suggesting that 100 to 150 micrograms similar to the doses used in total hip replacement are safe in this population, and I certainly have started to be more proactive about administering intrathecal morphine in hip fracture patients. What about peripheral nerve blocks? The results over at least one meta-analysis seem to suggest that they offer analgesic benefit. 
The question is, which block should we do? I've previously discussed this elsewhere and I won't go into any detail here. But these are a few common options to consider and studies that I recommend you read. Key things to bear in mind are that it may well be that certain blocks are better suited to certain surgeries. Remember to also consider the implication of any motor blockade for mobilization, although unlike an elective total hip replacement, most hip fracture patients are probably not going to mobilize on the day of surgery, and so motor sparing is not necessarily a priority.